right. Mr. Arna here, reading you Moses the Kitten by James Harriet, and illustrated by Peter Barrett. Moses the Kitten. Right. There have been times in the winter when I've regretted being a vet, and this looked like one of them. I had driven about 10 miles from home, thinking all the time that the dales always looked their coldest. Not when they were covered with snow, but as now, when the first sprinklings streaked the bare flanks of the fells and the bars of black and white, like the ribs of a crouching beast. And now in front of me was a farm gate, rattling on its hinges as the wind shook it. The car heaterless. Can you imagine a car with no heater? <laughs> wow. And drafty as it was, seemed like a haven in an uncharitable world. And I gripped the steering wheel tightly with my willing gloved hands for a few moments before opening the door. The wind almost tore the handle from my fingers as I got out, but I managed to crash the door shut before stumbling over the frozen mud to the gate. Muffled as I was in heavy coat and scarf pulled up to my ears, I could feel the icy gusts biting at my face, whipping up my nose and hammering it painfully into the air spaces in my head. I had driven through and streaming I was about to get back in the car when I noticed something unusual. There was a frozen pond just off the path, and among the rime-covered rushes which fringed the dead opacity of the surface, a small object stood out, shiny and black. I went over and looked closer. It was a tiny kitten, probably about six weeks old, huddled and immobile, eyes tightly closed, and bending down, I poked gently at the furry body. It must be dead. A morsel like this couldn't possibly survive in such a cold, but no. There was a spark of life because the mouth opened soundlessly for a second and closed. And Quickly, I lifted the little creature and tucked it inside my coat. And as I drove it to the farmyard, I called out to the farmer, who was carrying two buckets out of the calf house. I've got one of your kittens here, Mr. Butler. It must have strayed outside. Mr. Button put down his buckets and looked blank. Kitten? We haven't got no kittens at present. I showed him my finding and looked more puzzled. Well, that's a rum one. There's no black cats on this spot. We have all sorts of colors, but no black ones. Well, he must have come from somewhere else, I said. Though I can't imagine anything so small traveling very far. It's rather mysterious. I held the kitten out and he engulfed it with his big, roughened hand. Poor little beggar. He's only just alive. I'll take him into the house and see if the missus can do out for him. In the farm kitchen, Mrs. Butler was all concerned. Oh, what a shame! And she smoothed back the bedraggled hair with one finger. And she said, it's got such a pretty face. And she looked up at me and, what is it anyway, a him or a her? I took a quick look behind the hind legs. It's a Tom. Right, she said. I'll get him some warm milk and into him first, but we'll have to give him the old cure. She went over to the fireside oven on the big kitchen range, opened the door and popped him inside. I smiled. It was a classical procedure when newborn lambs were found suffering from cold and exposure. Into the oven they went, and the results were often dramatic. Mrs. Butler left the door partly open, and I could see the little black right there, the little black figure inside. He didn't seem to care much what was happening to him. No words for this page. Just soak it all in. The next hour I spent in the byre wrestling with the hind feet of a cow. The cleats were overgrown and grossly misshapen and upturned, causing the animal to hobble along on her heels. And My job was to pair and hack away the excess horn, and my long-held opinion that the hind feet of a cow were never meant to be handled by a man was thoroughly confirmed. We had a rope around the hawk and the leg and pulled up over a beam in the roof, but the leg still pissed and back and forth until I hung on till my teeth rattled. By the time I had finished, the sweat was running into my eyes, and I had quite forgotten the cold day outside. Still, I thought, as I eased the kinks from my spine where and finished, there were compensations. There was a satisfaction in the sight of a cow standing comfortably on the two almost normal-looking feet. Well, that's somewhat like, Mr. Butler grunted. Come in the house and wash your hands. In the kitchen, I bent over the brown earthenware sink, and I kept glancing across the oven. And Mrs. Butler laughed. Oh, he's still with us. Come and have a look. It was difficult to see the kitten in the dark interior. But when I spotted him, I put out my hands and touched him. And he turned his head towards me. He's coming round, I said. That hour in there has worked wonders. He's coming round. 
but I think there's a little toughen. She began to spoon warm milk into the tiny mouth, and I reckon we'll have him lapping in a day or two. You're going to keep him then? Two, two, we are. I'm going to call him Moses. Moses? Aye, you found him among the rushes, didn't you? I laugh, that's right. It's a good name. It was on the butler farm about a fortnight later, and I kept looking around for Moses. Farmers rarely have their cats in dye wars, and I thought that if the black kitten had survived, he would have joined the feline colony around the buildings. Farm cats have a pretty good time. They may not be petted or cosseted, but it always seemed to me that they lead a pretty free and natural life. They're expected to catch mice, but if they're not so inclined, there's abundant food at hand. Bowls of milk here and there, and the dog's dishes to be raided if anything interesting is left over. Look at all those cats. I've seen plenty of cats today. Some flitting nervously away, others friendly and purring, and there was a tabby loping gracefully across the cobbles, and a big tortoise shell was curled on a bed of straw at the warm end of a straw bed, and cats are connoisseurs of comfort. And when Mr. Butler went to fetch some hot water, I had a quick look in the bullock house, and a white tom regarded me placidly from between the bars of a hay rack where he'd been taking a siesta, and there was no sign of Moses. I finished drawing my arms and was about to make a casual reference to the kitten when Mr. Butler handed me my jacket and he said, Come round here with me if you've got a minute, he said. I've got something to show you. I followed him through the door at the end and across the passage into a long, low-roofed <laughs> low piggery. He stopped at a pen about halfway down and pointed inside. He said, Look here. I leaned over the wall, and my face must have shown my astonishment, because the farmer burst out into a shout of laughter. That's somewhat new for you, isn't it? Are you ready? Take in this picture, and tell me what you see that doesn't look quite right. Let me get that all the way open. I stared unbelievably down at the large sow stretched comfortably on her side, suckling a litter of about 12 piglets, and right there in the middle of the long pink row, furry black and incongruous, was Moses. He had a teat in his mouth and was absorbing his nourishment with the same rapt enjoyment as the smooth-skinned fellows on either side. What the devil, I gasped. Mr. Butler was still laughing. I thought you'd never seen anything like that before. I never have any road. But how did it happen? I still couldn't drag my eyes away. It was the missus's idea, he replied. When she got the little youth lap and milk, she took him out to a right warm spot for him in the buildings. She settled on this pen because the Sal Bertha just had one litter, and I had a heater in here, and it was grand and cozy. I nodded. Nodded. Sounds just right. Well, she put Moses and a bowl of milk in here, and but the little feller didn't stand by the heater very long. Next time I looked in, he was round at the milk bar. I shrugged my shoulders. They see, see something new every day at this game, but this is something I've never even heard of. Anyway, he looks well on it. Does he actually live on the sow's milk? Or does he still drink milk, does he still drink milk from his bowl? A bit of both, I reckon. It's hard to say. Anyway, whatever mixture Moses was getting, he grew rapidly into a sleek, handsome animal with an unusually high gloss to his coat which may or may not have been due to the porcine element of his diet. Porcine, I think that means pork or pig. I never went to the butler's without having a look in the pig pen. Bertha, his foster mother, seemed to find nothing unusual in this hairy intruder and pushed him around casually with some pleased grunts, just as she did with the rest of the brood. Moses, for his part, appeared to find the society of pigs very congenial. When the piglets curled up together and settled down for a nap, Moses would be somewhere in the heap. And when his young colleagues were weaned at eight weeks, he showed his attachment to Bertha by spending most of his time with her. That's really something, isn't it? And here we go. And it stayed that way over the years. Often he would be right inside the pen, rubbing himself happily along the comforting bulk of the sow and but I remember him best in his favorite place, crouching on the wall, looking down perhaps meditatively on what had been his first warm home. And that is the story of Moses.
The Kitten by James Harriet. See you guys later.